coming to tonight's meeting, showing up on Zoom. We certainly appreciate it. Although we'd much rather be meeting everybody in person, um, we appreciate you joining us tonight. We're hopeful that by the fall we'll get back to normal as we all learn our new normal anyways, and um, that we'll possibly be meeting in the fall. So tonight, um, first on our agenda and most important is our annual meeting and election of the Board of Directors for the West Boca Community Council. And I'm gonna go down the list of the candidates who have been nominated to the board and give you a quick bio on each, each person. First, Arthur Charwatt is from Boca West. Arthur is a native of Manhattan and a long career at United Merchandising Manufacturers where he oversaw $100 million in textile sales annually. And Arthur's been on our board. Um, and serves as our treasurer. Elliot Burns is from Waterbury. Elliot was born in Carnacy, New York, and lived in New Jersey and had a 35-year career with Michigan Public Schools. John Fisher, sorry, he was asleep. John Fisher Escondido. John is a retired paramedic firefighter captain from Palm Beach County Fire Field after serving West Boca from 1986 to 2013. John also plays the bagpipe at Government Memorial Service. Margie Helsing is from Saturnia. Margie moved from Washington, D.C. to Boca in 1986. Margie has served as president of the Boca Raton Republican Club, is a member of the Palm Beach uh, Party, uh, and is a junior league of Boca and the American Red Cross. Apologize, Jeanette, if I uh, ruin your name. From here after, you'll be called Jeanette K. Um, Timbers of Boca. Jeanette is originally from Bronx, New York. Jeanette studied Doctor of Nursing practice at FAU, as well as family nurse practitioner. Jeanette is the Dean and Director of Education at Bethesda Memorial Hospital. Paul Pontrelli, Boca Wind, originally from Brooklyn, New York, where Paul had a long career in law enforcement. Paul is a member of the American Italian American Club. Nick Ronjoni is at large, originally from Philadelphia. Nick has had, you got a has had a long career as an executive of the Target Corporation. Currently, Nick is director of sales for North American Bowman Hat Company. Neil Schiller from the Oak. Neil is originally from Gaithersburg, Maryland, and moved to Florida in 1994 to attend University of Miami where he received his Bachelor of Arts degree in 1997 in Juris Doctor. Neil is an attorney and founder of Government Law Group, which focuses on representing clients before governments involving land. Marilyn, I need you for a minute. Would, would everybody yeah. please mute themselves? Of all people. That <laughs> Neil is an attorney and founder of Government Law Group, which focuses on representing clients before governments involving land use, zoning, and development, contracts, and lobbying. Neil has served on the Palm Beach County Trauma Coalition, County's Mayor Ball, but Mayor's Ball, Jewish Association for Residential Care, and other civic organizations. Stanley Siegels from Century Village. Stanley is originally from Brooklyn. Stanley served in the U.S. Army from 1953 to 1955. After his service, he worked for a textile company for 40 years before relocating to Boca Raton. Stanley has served on many boards and committees, including Tethel Beth El Shalom, and many com uh, committees in Century Village, as well as on the board, and to Thurlow. Sherry Scarborough, that would be myself. I'm from Boca Isles North, originally from Youngstown, Ohio. I've enjoyed a long career in community association management. I'm not sure if enjoyed is the correct word, um, but I have. I also serve on the Palm Beach County Zoning Commission as well as other civic organizations. Ellen Winnicott is from Loggers Run and originally from Cleveland, Ohio. And a side note, her uncle was my pediatrician in Youngstown, Ohio. A, Ellen is a graduate of Boston University after which she moved to Boca Raton. Ellen was the library and media specialist at Sunrise Elementary prior to retiring. Ellen also serves on the Palm Beach County Li Library Advisory Board and is a tutor at Lynn University. Um, so those are our candidates. If I could have a motion to elect the nominees, 
the status that says a one-year term? I move, Elliot. Is there a second? I second. I ask that the secretary. I ask that the secretary cast one ballot for the election of directors. Elliot. Elliot, are you? Um, Elliot, you're you're muted. You want to unmute? Uh, I move that we cast a unanimous ballot for the board of directors. Okay, thank you. So congratulations to our board and to our newcomers, Jeanette and Neil. We look forward to, uh, and John, we look forward to, to working with you. I'm, I'm certain that our board will be be better because of you. So um, what we have been up to lately, Ellen and I attended um, the Palm Beach Chamber of Commerce annual breakfast where they uh, honored our Sheriff Rick Bradshaw. Um, also, we're really happy to announce that the 4th of July celebration at the Burt Aronson Regional Park will take place this year. Unlike past years, there will be no entertainment. Um, just come, remain in your car or around your car and enjoy the fireworks. We're, we're really thrilled that <coughs> we're doing that this year. We've successfully worked with Commissioner Sachs' office to obtain a flashing sign alerting to traffic, alerting the traffic to the entrance of Arborwood in order to permit residents in and out of their community. We continue to work with Commissioner Sachs to obtain a traffic light at Escondido and Timbers. Currently, the county has agreed to install a flashing uh, sign warning of the intersection for the two communities, although we're hopeful that this will work. We're doubtful because we've had a flashing sign there in the past, which did not work. But perhaps since the road has been redesigned, it'll work this time. If not, we will continue um, to fight to get a red light there to keep those residents safe. We continue to work to find a solution to the turnpike and glades interchange and the traffic there. State Representative Slosberg has been assisting me. Um, currently, the turnpike authority is conducting a survey once or a study and once the study has been completed we'll have a meeting with them to discuss that and that will be a public meeting where we have all of our members amazon fresh is coming to uptown boca <clears throat> and this is really a big deal because they've been scouting palm beach county for the past three years and they finally settled on west boca um, it was the most attractive um, location for their new store so we're, we're thrilled about that uh, we joined our sister organizations at the Palm Beach County Commission meeting to oppose Lakeward Drainage selling development rights to jail homes. Unfortunately, the commission approved this with only Commissioner Sachs and Commissioner Turner opposed. And um, <clears throat> we just felt that Lakeward Drainage really didn't have any development rights on the canal, but apparently the law states different. So um, genius on GL, GL's part, shame on Lakeward Drainage. Um, speaking of like we're drainage, they need the name of each association president, management company, or the person authorized to operate the discharge controls in the community. So if your community has a weir, um, you need to be in contact with Lake Worth Drainage. If you don't have the information, feel free to email me. I'll get it to you. Um, or you can go to the Lake Worth Drainage website, lwdd.net, for more information. But since we're in hurricane season, and although we've got a drought going on here, um, that could change at any time. So we need somebody in your community um, to be in touch with Lake Worth Drainage or for Lake Worth Drainage to get in touch with you to tell you um, when to open your weir and when to close your weir. So that will actually conclude um, our annual meeting. And we'll go into our public meeting. and. We have some of our elected officials that are here, as well as, I believe, Captain Moss is here. Do you want to unmute yourself and give us an update? Uh, yeah, I'll give you a real quick update. Good evening, everyone. Uh, also here with us today from the Sheriff's Office is the Executive Officer for West Boca, District 7, uh, Lieutenant Jason Johnson. On my screen, he's uh, in the second row on the right. Um, anyway, uh, so far this year for a crime update, uh, so we 
residential burglaries are down about 7%. Uh, most of our crime is down, which is a good sign. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, we can't take credit for it, uh, but when it goes down, we like to try. Uh, vehicle burglaries are actually down 101%. Um, so we have about half as many uh, vehicle burglaries this year as we did at the same time last year. Um, we're hoping a lot of that has to do with people not leaving their keys in their cars and also locking their vehicles um, and keeping things out of view. Um, we've also made a lot of significant arrests. So if we've had one or two groups uh, doing these uh, vehicle burglaries and you get them in jail, uh, they seem to slow down a lot. Um, stolen vehicles are down 6%, um, but again, you know, nationwide and uh, countywide, we do see uh, a little bit of an uptick in how it happens. Um, a lot of people try and go up handles, find open cars, and the key fobs in the car, so it makes it really easy. Uh, one of the initiatives that we put out recently to Century Village and uh, also with CVS and Walgreens is getting the word out is a stop, a stop the scam initiative. Um, basically, it's all these scams that target uh, anyone either by, by use of mail, uh, email, and also on your telephone all the time, um, on your computers, uh, groups claiming to be the IRS or an attorney that has someone in custody and they want some kind of payment and they request uh, you to go to the store and get gift cards and send them all the numbers off the gift cards. If, if you have anything like that, it's a scam, so please uh, don't participate and uh, tell anyone that you know, especially if they're vulnerable to you know, believing some of these things. The people are good, that's how they get money, um, but don't participate. That's my update. Uh, unless there are any questions, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, I don't know if uh, Senator Postfeet's here tonight. Hi, Senator. You want to unmute yourself and give an update? Sure. Hi, everyone. It's Tina Postfeet. Um, I wanted to just come on and say hello as this is the first opportunity since we came back from legislative session in Tallahassee. And it's my third year representing you all in West Boca. I was the state representative. Um, that position has been filled by Kelly Skidmore, and now I am your state Senator, which previously was held by Kevin Rader, I have a larger area now, but still maintain um, uh, over West Boca, all of Boca, as a matter of fact. Um, there was a lot to unpack from the session, so I won't do that now. If you guys, you know, want to do a full legislative update, I'm happy to do that. Um, but I just wanted to say hello to everyone, to see your faces again. It's been a long time. And, and, you know, I'm a resident here in West Boca, I'm very proud to represent you all. Um, if you have any issues relating to state business, unemployment, um, you know, other, some condo, HOA situations we can help with, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you guys deal with is county, as um, Sherry mentioned, you know, uh, Commissioner Sachs uh, for, for those road things, but I can help as well, um, you know, with the turnpike issues, et cetera. So, you know, please feel free to reach out to my office for anything. If you don't have my information, you can certainly get it from Sherry or go to the Florida Senate website. Uh, you know, really the most important thing we do is constituent services. We are in Tallahassee for nine weeks plus committee weeks and we do, do a lot. But, um, you know, really I think the heart and soul of the job is to help individuals in District 29. So, you know, please feel free to reach out. And uh, congratulations to the board members. This is a great group. And I look forward to being back in person soon one day. Um, and just the last note is, you know, really the main job of the legislature each year is to pass a budget. And just for your knowledge, um, the budget was passed at $100 billion. That's for the B. For the state of Florida, um, I got some good projects in for the district. Some were vetoed. Everybody had some vetoes. Um, but I still did get quite a few projects for different charitable groups and some of the cities in the district, and very happy to bring that back. I uh, got to pass a few laws and put amendments on other bills, uh, but it was a really tough session. So I can get into that in the future, and I know Supervisor Link will talk about the election 
bill. I was very proud to work with her closely during the committee process on that bill. She answered a lot of my questions and she helped me understand and I certainly got her perspective. It's, it's, a, it's not a great bill and um, she'll be able to explain that to you in detail, but it's great to be able to work with her and, um, you know, at least for me to get all the information I need because some of it is pretty technical. Um, so with that, I'll let you get back to the meeting and I look forward to hearing what the rest of the speakers have to say. But please feel free to reach out if you need anything. Everyone, I hope you've been vaccinated. They're readily available now. Um, get ready for hurricane season and um, everyone be safe, be well, and I look forward to seeing you in person um, in the not so distant future. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, Representative Skidmore. Absolutely. Just a quick update to tell all of you that we are finally having in-person graduations. We started last week, and prior to joining you tonight, I was at the graduation for West Polka Community High School, and they had over 400 students walk across the stage. Um, 75 were not there, were not able to attend, but their names were read. You can catch all of our uh, graduations on our website. They're all being recorded so everybody can see their families and, and enjoy them. It's been different this year because we have the students in a separate room from the parents, but it's worked out very well. The students are wearing masks when they first come in in the procession, but then when they come to get their diploma, they take their masks off and the photographs are taken so the family can enjoy seeing their smiling faces. So um, that's very exciting. The other thing I wanted to mention, although Senator Polsky didn't go into the legislation. Um, I personally want to thank her on behalf of the school board. There was a piece of legislation that Senator Berman had um, put out, which Senator Polsky worked with her on, I believe, and that had to do with retention of students um, for this year only. It's only this year, students in grades K through grade five, if the parent wants them retained, because we know COVID had, you know, these last this last year and a half has been very difficult. If a parent wants their child retained, all they need to do is contact the principal of their school in the month of June. We did send information out, and if the parent wants it, the child will be retained. Um, if the parent requests it after June, then it's still gonna be a principal decision. Um, I, would just, I just want you to know that the school board administration opposed the legislation, but we didn't let them do it publicly because the entire school board supported it. So we say thank you very much. We know how hard it's been for parents, and especially those little ones, you know, in kindergartens and grade, grades one and two especially. Um, a lot of the parents really want them to start over. So thank you, Senator Polsky. Congratulations to all the newly elected board members, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate that. excited about. Also our either or uh, station out by the Bird Aronson Park that is going to be fully staffed. It's supposed to be fully staffed by September. So we're hopeful. We've been promised that for the last several years and um, we're looking forward to that. I also hear that they are looking at our stations that we've been requesting that they rebuild them. I know they've had an architect at a couple of them. So we're hopeful that um, we'll see new stations in West Boca in the near future. Did I miss any other elected officials? Well, I know Wendy's here. Wendy's going to speak in a second. Um, anybody else? Okay. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our supervisor of elections to give us an update, tell us about, about the new bill and what we can expect, and um, thank you for all your hard work. Thank you so very much for having me. I apologize.
apologize. I was uh, wasn't sure what time they told me to get on right at five thirty. So I apologize. I'm in uh, in between uh, places. Uh, so, but I wanted to um, just give you a couple of updates. Um, I know they said just to talk for about five minutes. So the first thing we have is, although I don't think most of your communities are going to be part of it, but we do have Congressman Alfie Hastings seat, uh, who's, which is coming up. And we will also have any resigned to run seats that may come up as part of that. Uh, the primary election is going to be November 2nd with the general election being on January 11th. With that, the qualifying period is going to start for August 9th and 10th. So it'll begin at 8 a.m. on the 9th, and it will end at noon on the 10th. Um, we do think that we know, we believe we'll have at least one uh, person that is uh, going to be resigning to run. Uh, so it could result in us having a second special election, depending upon when that person actually does his resignation. Uh, and as you know, the Florida legislature was very busy uh, as it related to elections. We did make some changes to the bill, which uh, helped it uh, some, but we also had some things that are going to make some changes for voters. Uh, the one being that vote by mail ballots will only be good for one general election cycle. But if you have a vote by mail ballot uh, or request on file, and you had put that you wanted all elections through 2024, it will be at least valid through November 2022. So you will have that ability to vote there. Uh, after that, you'll need to request it each general election cycle. And we will be uh, doing the best we can to do a lot of outreach to let people know that. Unfortunately, we're no longer able to have the check boxes on our envelopes that we used to have. That's something else that came out with the legislation. So you'll now also have to provide either your Florida ID, driver's license, or the last four digits of your social security number to make a number of changes as well as to request a vote by mail ballot. So those are some of the things that are going to come up. Our, uh, our uh, drop boxes have, uh, again, more changes. We will be able, thank goodness we made some changes, and we are able to have the vote by mail uh, ballots dropped at early voting, during early voting hours still. Uh, but at our main office and our outer offices, we'll only be able to do it while we have them staffed. And so we'll be working with the county commission and, and on a budget to be able to increase those hours that we can have them staffed. I've also requested that the Postal Service consider putting a U.S. Postal Service box uh, at each of our four offices to make it convenient for voters if they do come when we're not open, that they would be able to just drop it into the U.S. Postal Service box. Um, we are also going to have, there, there is a change which does say that you cannot have more than two ballots that are not yours or your immediate family members. So that's going to be very important that you know that you can only turn in two ballots that are not yours or your immediate family members for each election. It's yet to be determined by the state how they're going to monitor that. That will be uh, taken up in rulemaking coming up. Uh, there are some other changes that were made related to third-party voter registration organizations and uh, registering folks, and we're going to be working with those groups to make sure that they have that information as well. So those are the key things that I think were really important. Uh, and, you know, say there's, it's, the, the, the bill is about 124 pages long, so there are obviously a lot of, of technicality things in there. But if there are any specific questions that I can answer for you, I'm more than happy to do that. Does anybody have any questions? I, I have one. Um, I think I know the answer, to, but I want to verify it. Can you accept volunteers um, to monitor the, the boxes? No, that's a very good question. I do not believe so. The, one of the bills that one part of the bill that was passed says that we cannot re, uh, receive from any organization any funds related to an election. Uh, it also in that same sense says that we can't accept personal services. One of the questions that we're looking at is how how far does that extend? Because we do have people who are have in the past volunteered in our office as well as volunteered in different ways uh, during the election that have you know, been great for us and have certainly saved the county and the taxpayers a lot of money.
money and it's things that they enjoy doing. A lot of them are recently retired. So we couldn't pay them because it would mess up their retirement. Uh, it's just a state FRS system retirement fund. Uh, so we are, we have asked for some clarification from the state. They've not been able to get that to any of the counties so far, but we believe that it's going to prohibit us from having any volunteer work. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? If I may, uh, Tina Polsky, I just wanted to um, tell Supervisor Link and, and all of you that um, you're, we're going back to session in January when we start committee weeks in September. And, um, you know, if you have any, any glitches to that bill that haven't been worked out by that time, I'd be happy to bring forth as a bill to fix some things like volunteering in the office should be an exception to that rule. Um, that Supervisor Link is talking about. Really what that refers to is, um, if you remember during the pandemic, there were some outside groups that gave money to, to supervisors and offices to help them get the word out about mail-in voting. And, um, and for some reason, the legislature took offense to that money and thought it was partisan in some way, even though the mail that they, that they used the money for and the mail that went out was just to tell people to register to vote by mail. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes that goes too far. And after the bill passed and some time has settled, the next year you can come back with um, some fixes. So um, I'm sure we'll be in touch, but I'd, I'd really be happy to continue uh, refining that bill and making it a, a bad bill better and, and trying to do some fixes to it next year. But Bob, that's an important point about volunteers. We should not um, have people not be able to volunteer in the office and help out. Thank you. I, I obviously greatly appreciate that. And we appreciate all of your help, uh, Senator Polsky, because I know we, as you mentioned, we were in touch and, and appreciated, even if we weren't victorious, getting all the way, but getting that information out about the, the parts of the bill that were the, the most damaging to voters uh, and that made it more difficult. As we've stated, this was not a partisan issue uh, because uh, we have both Republican and Democratic uh, supervisors of election and including some that had previously been in the legislature uh, and when they were in the legislature a number of them were the most conservative Republicans and they were the ones leading the charge against this bill uh, because it just procedurally while we all re totally respect the ability of our legislators to make laws and you know our job is to implement the laws that are made and we understand that but sometimes if you're not getting the input of those who are running the, the, what's actually happening, what you're trying to achieve isn't being achieved and all you're doing is messing up the procedures. And so it goes against necessarily a philosophy, which again, we all respect that that's the division and that's the way it works. Uh, but we were just trying to say, let's make the procedures that one that's not gonna be extraordinarily expensive for the counties and that's going to be very disenfranchising for voters. So uh, we appreciate again your work and, and helping us to, to get that word out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't worry, I have one presentation <laughs> this morning and it was very impressive, but one of the things that I was most impressed about was the poll worker program for community organizations. Uh, so, yeah, the adopt a precinct program is, is a great program that we have, and it allows us to work with organizations who are trying to raise money for themselves or for a charity, and so they will bring to us their volunteers who are willing to volunteer on their behalf. We then will pay, we'll train them and do everything we would as for any normal polling location, uh, but then those volunteers will uh, direct us to pay the pay that we would have paid to them to the uh, to the organization. And so it's a great way for organizations who have volunteers that want to help them uh, to then work for us and then raise the money for themselves for the organization. So it's worked out great. Those who have done it, uh, with the exception of one, they've all come back and uh, they enjoy it. It's obviously a great civic duty, but it is, you know, an organization can raise $2,500, you know, in that day, so. That's great. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for our supervisor of elections? 
Yes, Wendy, can you speak uh, to the uh, new rules regarding uh, citizen proposals to a constitutional amendment and uh, what new restrictions may have been placed on that? Uh, I'm not certain about that. The only thing that I'm aware of related to that is that there's a, the law change that we have to charge actual costs. And so it had been 10 cents per petition for, I think since 19, it was either 72 or 76 that was put in place and it hadn't been increased. So we're required to show the actual processing cost of that and to charge that actual cost. Uh, I think they figured out with inflation that would be then about 48 cents per petition. Our actual cost that we're showing is 45 cents. I think they range from, you know, I don't know the low end, but a high end up to, I think, 88 cents. Uh, so that's the only thing that I'm aware of. Um, perhaps Senator Polsky could help me with that. Yes, um, there was actually one important law that was passed this past session, but over the three years that I've been there, the citizen initiative process has gotten much more difficult. And so over the, uh, each year, there's been a, a more um, stringent set of requirements put on to make it, you have to have more signatures before the Supreme Court can approve. The legislature gets to put some language on the ballot about the costs of, of um, what the initiative is trying to do and, and sort of the legislature's perspective on the initiative. Uh, there are lots of, of um, rules like that. But what happened this past year uh, was the campaign contributions for citizens initiatives. So let's say there is, actually there are citizen, uh, I'll use a real example. So there was a citizens initiative to make um, marijuana legal for adult use. And it went before the Supreme Court and it actually failed, so that will not be on the, the ballot you see in 2022. But um, when that initiative is in the, the formation process, there's a political committee that's formed just for the purpose of collecting contributions and doing everything they need to do, getting signatures and getting it ready for the um, Supreme Court approval process. During that time period of the formation, what they did this year is they limited the contributions. So um, it's $3,000 per person is the maximum that anyone can donate to a citizen initiative political committee during the formation process. Once it is agreed that it will be on the ballot, then I believe that that contribution limit is gone. But the important thing is the formation process is the expensive process. Um, you have to get signatures. Um, uh, it's like in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands to get an initiative put on the ballot. And that all has to be done well in advance of the Supreme Court approving it. Um, and there were more restrictions put on over the last few years about how people pay for those signatures, making it much more expensive. So it, it, the fact that they are limiting contributions is really problematic because it's going to make it hard to um, collect enough money for these initiatives. And just as a reference point, I have a political committee. Every single candidate basically does, or a sitting elected official. You have no limitations on what you can give. A company can give me $100,000 if they want. An individual can give me $100,000. My hard campaign, um, no, that's a $1,000 limit per person or company. But that's why everyone has a political committee. So there's unlimited. That's like sort of the dark money you hear about. Even though, you know, my name is on it, it's not, there's nothing dark about it. Um, and that, all that information is out there. But just as an example, there's no limitation on what you can give me in the political committee. So every legislator that voted on this, I voted no, but everyone who voted yes, they can get as much as they want, but a citizen initiative political committee cannot. So they can only get 3,000. And, and it's so hard because over the last few years, they've made it so much harder. So that's the real negative stuff that's happening with citizens initiatives and has happened over the last couple of years. And one bill that did die, in case you heard about this, was a citizens initiative has to pass by 60% of the vote. I just need 50%, 51% to win. But a, a ballot initiative has to have 60%, a very high threshold in Florida, you know how close all of our elections are. And all those good initiatives that you heard about you know, over the last couple of years, medical marijuana, environmental lands, um, Amendment 4, those got about 64, 65%, which is like a blowout in Florida. 
So there was, there's been an, uh, a proposal over the last several years to make a citizen's initiative have to win by 66.6% .6 of the vote, which would be impossible for many of them. And our history shows that that really can't be accomplished. And that has passed through the House and it didn't pass through the Senate. And it's been going on for a couple of years. So that die, that is not the law, but it's out there and they want to do it. But the campaign contribution did pass this year and it was signed by the governor. Thank you. Um, any other questions for our supervisor of elections? Okay. We're going to... Well, I, I, if I can just, we'll be sending an invitation to your group, uh, but on June 22nd, I wanted to make sure that you knew we're going to hope to have a host an open house for anybody who's interested in sort of a behind the scenes at how the elections work. Uh, what we do for the security, the way that we get our mail, send it out, uh, vote by mail, how it's tracked, where, how our tabulation works, how the opening process and the duplication, canvassing, it'll be at our voting equipment center in Riviera Beach. Uh, but we would love to have you come. We're going to have a couple of guided type tours uh, at 10 in the morning, I think at 4 in the afternoon. But there'll also be opportunities for people just to drop in. We'll have nine different stations that you can just sort of self go to if you'd like. And uh, it's, it's really, I think that everybody who's come to us to do this has left just saying, I'm blown away. I had no idea that's what was involved and how it worked. So we wanted to make sure that we opened it up to groups to be able to do that. So you'll get an invitation this week, but if you're interested on June 22nd, we would absolutely love to have you come and explain a little bit more about our process. Great. That, that sounds great. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know you're busy. I know you're on your way to another meeting. So thank you. And we look forward to getting that invitation and seeing you soon. Have a great night. Thank you again. Really appreciate it. So we'll move on now to our hurricane preparedness. We're already in the hurricane season. Um, and we have asked Michael Jankowski um, from emergency management. He's an emergency management specialist with Palm Beach County Division of Emergency Management. He is the community outreach co coordinator for the division and has been with Palm Beach County for six years and has been in public safety for over 30 years. So Michael, I know you've got a great presentation. So if everybody would mute themselves and um, we will give Mike the floor to tell us what, what to expect. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Great, thank you very much. Um, can you go ahead and give me the ability to share my screen, please? Sure, will. And, and while you're doing that, I want to give a quick little shout out. I, I happen to hear you're from uh, Youngstown, Ohio. I am. Well, I can, uh, so am I, actually. You're kidding. Really? No, I am from Youngstown, Ohio, uh, and I have family that uh, lives up in Cleveland. So oh, wow. I, still, I still have a, a bunch of family up in the 330. <laughs> Where, where in Youngstown are you from? Um, I'm actually from uh, Austin Town, and oh. uh, I worked for the Mahoney County 911, um, which was downtown for uh, quite some time. I can only imagine. I can oh, only imagine. Okay. But, yep, my sister lives in Austin Town. So there you go. There's the screen. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's do your thing. All right. You can see my screen, everybody? Yep. 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 All right, very good. Okay, well, again, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, share some hurricane preparedness information with your group. Um, it's, it is uh, quite an honor to, uh, to get to be here, and um, I, I do enjoy sharing our information, making sure that we keep our community safe. Again, my name is Michael Jankowski. I'm with Palm Beach County Division. Recording in progress. Uh, Palm Beach County Division of Emergency Management. So what exactly is emergency management? A lot of people, when they, they think of us, they think of we're the hurricane people. And we are actually a lot more than just hurricanes. Uh, emergency management is a managerial function, uh, which uh, creates a framework to, to protect and respond to a variety of type of uh, different disasters and emergencies, which we're going to talk about in just one second. Our mission at Palm Beach County Emergency Management is to minimize the impact of emergencies and disasters to our community through uh, education, planning, response, and coordinating information and resources. Uh, one of the biggest things that we do, of course, is our community outreach, which is what I'm here for tonight. Um, so that's just part of what we get to do. 
So we look at um, emergency management as a whole community approach. That means that we it, it really does take everybody to help uh, respond and recover from, from disasters. Uh, our first responders, uh, such as our representatives from the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, our local government, and uh, our representatives uh, that were joining us tonight are a big part of helping us to um, to respond and recover from disasters. We also look at our businesses, our nonprofit sector, um, and our private sector as well. Businesses such as uh, Publix and Home Depot, places where we can get supplies to help us prepare our emergency kits or help us uh, to get water after a disaster. We also look at our nonprofit organizations, our, our churches, and our, our, our religious leaders that will also be there to help us out uh, in times of need. And of course, the public. This is you. Without you, we really would have a hard time being able to get back to normalcy. So as I said, Palm Beach County uh, does respond to more than just hurricanes. As a matter of fact, we have uh, found that there are 12 core hazards that can are, are likely to affect Palm Beach County. And we've broken this down into three different categories. Our natural disasters, such as severe weather, hurricanes, uh, thunderstorms, flooding, Wildfires, we know that we're in our dry season right now, and we've had uh, quite a few wildfires uh, from uh, Barton County down to Broward County. Communicable diseases, of course, you know, we, we know that we're in uh, one right now with, uh, with COVID-19. And our agricultural diseases, these are the things that can affect our crops, such as um, uh, the orange canker disease that can uh, be devastating to our, um, our orange, pop, the orange crop out west. Technological hazards. We have transportation. You know, we have uh, several different rail companies that go through Palm Beach County. Uh, several different airports. Major hubs such as the Turnpike and uh, I-95. Um, hazardous materials are transported through that transportation system. Our nuclear power plant. Now you might say, hold on, Mike. We don't have a nuclear power plant in Palm Beach County. Why did that make the list? Well, because we do recognize that St. Lucie County does have one. And in the event that something should happen there, in the very unlikely event, the folks that are in St. Lucie County and Martin County, if they have to evacuate, they're going to come down here to Palm Beach County, and we're going to help them out. And, of course, we have the dike failure um, as a threat or a concern over at Lake Okeechobee. Of course, the Army Corps of Engineers does a great job on supporting that and doing some work on it, but we still want to be aware of it. And then, of course, we have our human-caused hazards, such as work and school place violence, domestic security, which would be our homegrown terrorism or things like that, and mass migration. So those are some of the things that we, got, we, we constantly plan for and prepare for. But we're here to talk about hurricanes. So what exactly is a hurricane? Well, a hurricane, by definition, is a large rotating storm with high-speed winds that forms over warm waters in the tropical areas. Of course, we know that the hurricane season runs from June 1st, to November 30th, so we're just a couple of uh, weeks into the hurricane season. But it's important to remember that tropical systems do not necessarily pay attention to the calendar. Tropical storms can form at any time of the year. Case in point this year, Anna. Anna formed over Bermuda, uh, what, the middle of May. And it's been known to happen before. I remember back a few years ago, we had an A named storm in January. So either a very early or very late, depending on how you want to look at the, uh, the calendar. But it can happen. So it's important that we know what the difference is between hurricane watches and hurricane warnings. A hurricane watch or tropical storm watch is an announcement that sustained winds are possible within the area within the next 48 hours. Whereas the warning it's saying that those um, those tropical storm sustained winds are expected within the next 36 hours. So you can see there's a little bit of an overlap there, and sometimes we might actually have a tropical storm watch with a tropical storm warning at the same time, and it can kind of depend on where along the coast um, these can happen as well. Big takeaway from this slide, though, is please remember there is a difference between a tropical storm watch and your typical thunderstorm watches and warnings, tornado watches and warnings, flash floods. Those are usually a lot more imminent. So if you hear that there's a, a severe thunderstorm warning for the West Boca community, 
you know that's probably going to be within the next hour or so. So I just I'd like to point that out that there is a difference. So this uh, slide here kind of shows you the difference of wind speeds of hurricanes. Uh, you'll notice there's the categories one through five, and then there's the potential damage that each one could um, could have. Now it's important to understand when we talk about a category one or a category three hurricane, we're actually only referring to the wind speed of the storm, not the rain um, or the flooding that might happen. It's just the wind speed. It's important to also remember here that it does not necessarily have to be a hurricane in order for it to be dangerous. And a case in point that I like to mention is Tropical Storm Isaac from 2012. If, uh, if, you, were, uh, if you remember when Isaac passed by Florida, it went through the Florida Straits, even south of the Keys, as just a tropical storm. But in the meantime, El Loxahatchee, they received almost 16 inches of rain almost 14 inches down in Boynton Beach. Even this past year, um, if you remember, October and November were a pretty wet fall. I mean, we were getting a lot of rain in a short amount of time, and that was already causing some flooding. And when Tropical Storm Etta approached the area, we also had some more flooding issues, and I believe that there was a, um, some significant flooding down in the, the Boca Raton area, in the South County area. So that's why I say it's important when you hear someone say, oh, it, it's just a tropical storm, I'm not going to worry. That concerns me because as you can see, there's a lot of rain that can happen and rain in the water is some of the most dangerous parts of these storms. So the, the, the takeaway here is please take each one of these systems seriously. So what is the most dangerous part of the hurricane or tropical system, I should say, would be the storm surge. Now, this is that sudden push of water that comes onshore from the storm. Uh, if a storm, for example, is coming off of the Atlantic, uh, you get a lot of that storm surge coming on to the, um, the barrier islands. Um, or not so much on the intercoastal, but it can still happen. If you remember, uh, back in 2017, Hurricane Michael, when it came ashore in the Panhandle, a lot of that damage in places like Mexico Beach, that was actually caused by the storm surge. It's a lot of water that's being pushed up on shore, and that water can be very, very, very strong. While we're talking about flooding, I'd like to point out, flooding is still very, very dangerous. Just six inches of running water is enough to knock you off of your feet. Just 12 inches of water is enough to carry away some compact vehicles or smaller cars. 18 to 24 inches of water will carry away most SUVs, vans, and trucks. And this is just an idea of some of the different types of floodings that you might hear about. Flash flooding, that's something that occurs quickly. Coastal flooding, obviously right along uh, the coast. Um, and then aerial flooding. That's usually not so much life-threatening, but that's water that's kind of rising a little bit slowly at a time, not necessarily as fast as, as, as a flash flood. The biggest thing to remember when it comes to any flooding, especially on roads, is turn around, don't drown. You might think you know how that road is like. You've traveled it a thousand times, but the bottom line is you don't know how fast water is moving. You don't know what hazards are laying underneath that water. You don't even know that block road could have gotten washed out and you could get stranded. So just it, it, it's better to find a different way to your destination. We like to say arrive alive, turn around, don't drown. If you do happen to see flooding in your neighborhood, call your property manager or your local government as soon as possible. If it's an absolute immediate emergency, someone is stuck in a flood water, for example, call 911 immediately. So, if you remember earlier, I said it takes uh, the, the community. You are part of our whole community approach. What can you do to be prepared for a hurricane? Well, Palm Beach County has a four-step approach. We want you to make a plan, build a kit, get involved, and be informed. So let's talk about making a plan. There's three things that we want to take away from this. We want you to know your hazards, know your zones, and I'll explain those in a second, and have a communication plan in place. So knowing your hazards, what exactly does this mean? 
Well, first of all, you want to know your city or your town. Do you live, for example, on a barrier island? Now, I know this is a West, commu West uh, community, so you don't live on a barrier island. But how about family? Do you have family that might live on a barrier island when a hurricane is coming? Are you in a flood-prone area or a flood zone? How about your neighborhood? Do you have retention ponds or streams or canals around your area that might flood? How about debris? Um, a lot of times this time of year, we have our landscapers coming around. They're pruning back some of the palm trees or other shrubs. And what do they do? They usually leave those piles in the middle of the road, like along the swell, the side of the road there, for another company to come by and pick up. Well, that debris could be a hazard if something is coming soon and the winds pick it up. How about our homes? Do you by chance live in an older home? Do you have older doors? Um, how about your windows? Are they secure? Do you have good windows? Do you have impact-proof windows? How about your roof? Is it in good, stable condition? Now, most homes that are built now today are built to a very strong um, uh, hurricane standard. Um, and if, if, as you know, if you buy a house, you have to go through a bunch of inspections and four-point inspections to make sure your roof is good. So you want to know how all of that is for your house. And then your family's vulnerabilities. Do you have any elderly uh, relatives that live with you? How about children? Or what about pets? We want to make sure that we're planning for everybody. Do you have any medical issues or concerns? For example, do you require oxygen 24-7? Do you have a, a, a CPAP or other type of um, items that require electricity? So those are some of the things that you want to know regarding your own hazards and how they could be affected by a disaster. Making a plan also means you should know if you live in a flood zone or a hurricane evacuation zone. Now, if you remember, I said that there were two types of zones, and these are those zones. First of all, a hurricane evacuation zone, those are primarily along the coast or in um, housing that is um, below the code that I mentioned earlier, or more specifically, uh, places like mobile home parks. Um, those would be evacuation zones as well, not necessarily along the coach, or coast, I'm sorry, they could be further inland. Flood zones. Uh, these are areas in the county that are susceptible to flooding waters. Um, as I mentioned in my previous slide, uh, Loxahatchee, there's areas out there that are known to get quite a bit of rain. Um, I believe in the, uh, some areas even in, in Boca Raton um, can get some, some rain. So you want to know, hey, do I live in one of these zones? Best place to find that out is to go to www readypvc.com there you can actually go to our tools though uh, you can type in your address and check if you're an evacuation zone or a flood zone two different tools to look at so you make sure that you want to look at both of those you also uh, want to know where your uh, shelters are should you need to evacuate grocery stores gas stations where you can get building supplies and things like that all of that is also on our website So, how about um, if we need to evacuate? You should know if you have to evacuate, where you're going to go, and how you're going to get there. There's two big things that we like to talk about with, with emergency management. One, run from the water, hide from the wind. What does this mean? Well, if you remember, I said that the storm surge was that most dangerous part of the hurricane. That's the one area that we want to make sure that we're, we're watching the most. How much water is going to come on shore? And those people that live in those evacuation zones are the ones that we're going to want to evacuate. For most of the rest of us, as I said, we live in pretty good solid homes that, um, that we're going to be able to shelter in place so we can hide from the wind. If you do feel that you need to evacuate, we want you to think about evacuating miles, not hundreds of miles. In the picture that you see on the screen, this is an actual picture taken during Hurricane Irma. Uh, back in 2016, I think it was, when Irma was approaching Florida, um, it was already considered a major hurricane, and it was expected that it was going to impact Palm Beach County pretty hard. A lot of people decided they were going to get out of Dodge, got in their cars, got in their trucks, hit the freeway, and started either going north to, uh, to Georgia or west to um, the, the Tampa Bay area. Well, what ended up happening? 
the hurricane decided to shift and it went up the spine of the state. That meant that a lot of people ended up getting stranded on the road because traffic was so backed up that some people ran out of gas um, or they ended up in the path of Hurricane Irma. So that's why we suggest just go miles. If you have to evacuate, if you're in a home that you're not sure if it's going to stand, um, maybe go to a friend or a family member's house somewhere a little further inland, about a hotel. Or if you do need to go to a shelter, you're more than welcome to. Uh, there's two things to remember, that a shelter should be your last resort and space will be limited in the shelter. So how much space are we talking? We're only giving 20 square feet. That box is about a five foot by four foot box. That's per person in, in the house. That's basically enough room for just your bare essentials uh, for to last you just a couple of days. And you can see in the picture here, uh, there's some snacks in there, cell phone, some medication, um, some, uh, some looks like uh, some maybe some bikes and some hygiene stuff. That's basically what you're gonna wanna take to the shelter. Now, a lot of people do ask in today's um, new norm, how are we doing this when it comes to COVID? Well, emergency management has come up with a plan and we are still using our shelters, but we're giving more space between families. So if, for example, um, I see there's a family of three coming into the shelter, each person in that family is gonna get a 20 square foot box. And then the next family that comes in, they're gonna be about six feet away from the, uh, the first family. Um, we use some of the school buildings in Palm Beach County, so we probably will use different school or, uh, classrooms within the school. Um, we make sure that everybody is you know, uh, screened, temperature checked and all of that. So we're making sure that everybody is still safe and protected even during um, the, the COVID norm. Speaking of shelters, uh, Palm Beach County has established two special shelters. One is a special needs program shelter. This is to help citizens with certain medical problems during a major emergency. If you remember earlier, I said, if you are somebody who requires um, oxygen or electricity to run a, uh, a CPAP machine or um, anything along that line, you will qualify to go to a special needs shelter if you're concerned that you're gonna lose power during a storm, it's highly recommended that you sign up for the shelter. I'll explain how to do that in just one second. We also have a special, a, a pet friendly shelter. This one's for our fur babies. If you're going to feel like you need to evacuate um, and you are, um, you don't wanna leave your pets at home, there's a shelter for that as well. Can everybody hear me okay? We hear you. Okay. I just had a uh, pop-up come up and it just looked like it kicked me out of the meeting. We're still good? Yeah. We, we're good. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, making a plan. Uh, also, I'm sorry, let me back up here. I got a little bit sidetracked when a little pop-up came up there. Both of these shelters you do need to pre-register for. Um, the special needs shelter is available at 561-712-6400, and you can go to our website at readypbc.com uh, to fill out the application. The pet-friendly shelter is also available through uh, Palm Beach County, County's Animal Care and Control, and their phone number is also on the screen. Okay, so we talked earlier about uh, making a plan also includes a communication plan. So this is how you're going to stay in touch with uh, your family and friends when everyday methods of communication are not available. You want to make sure that you're also including out of town family and friends, friends in this communication plan. Um, if, if you remember earlier, I said um, that I'm actually from Youngstown, Ohio. Um, Back in the 2004 hurricane season, when um, I think it was Jean and Francis came through, um, my parents were already living in Palm Beach County. And the first storm came through, 
afterwards. I called them. Everything was okay, so on and so forth. Good. Made me feel good. Second storm comes through a couple of weeks later. We go through this process again, but this time when I tried to call them, there was no answer. I was in panic mode. Um, I, their cell phones weren't answering. The home phone didn't answer. My brother, who was living down here and with them, was not answering. I didn't know what was going on. It, it turned out that because uh, that second storm was going to be so bad and they'd already had some damage to the house from the first storm, that they decided to go to a shelter. They forgot to call. So that's why this is super, super important to me. Um, your family and your friends out of the area are going to really appreciate it if you keep them in the know. Um, it could be as simple as taking your cell phone and changing your voicemail. Hi, this is Mike. I just want you to know we're going to a shelter to escape the storm. I'll call you when I can. And that's it. That way, even if our cell phone happens to go out because of power loss, the, uh, the, they're still going to get your voicemail. So just a little little bit of a tip there, but please make sure you include that. Um, so in your communication thing, you want to make sure you have a list of telephone numbers, a list of email addresses, and a list of main places to meet. Telephone numbers is super important. In a world with cell phones, how many of you actually remember phone numbers? I mean, I don't even know my own phone numbers sometimes because everything is great in the cell phone. So have it written down. Make sure that you have a backup plan written down. List of email addresses as well. And a list of meeting places so that not so much for a hurricane because when those are coming, we know it's coming. But if it's something that's a little bit more of an imminent type of an emergency, you want to have an idea of, okay, we're going to meet at um, such and such HOA's clubhouse. That is a, a, you know, a, a good plan to have. Biggest thing here is practice that plan often. Once a month, get everybody together and say, okay, we're gonna practice our plan, go. Okay, so after a disaster, please don't wait to let family and friends know that you're safe. Social media sites like Facebook, they have the safety check. I'm sure probably you've all seen it from different things. Some of them are mean, some funny things, but for the most part, they're very serious. Um, it says, you know, hey, I survived, I'm okay. And again, that's going to really help people know that you're okay, especially if other means of communication, such as telephones, are still out and you can't make phone calls. Okay, so step two is to build a kit. We're going to talk about the emergency essentials, important documents, and some special items you should have. What should you pack in your kit? Um, first of all, this is, this is more for when you're staying at home, by the way. Um, if you're going to go to a shelter, you still want to take up some, a few things like some water, snacks, um, extra clothing, pillows and blankets. But this list is more specifically for if you're staying at home. Water. You want to have one gallon per person per day for every person and pet that's in the house. Please don't forget our fur babies. Sometimes we can forget them and say, well, I had a gallon of water per person per day for five days but I forgot about, um, you know, scruffles. Canned foods and snacks, especially if you're gonna do this, make sure you have a can opener. Um, battery powered radio, hand crank radios, flashlights, extra batteries. You know, everybody knows we should have those. Personal hygiene supplies, you know, get some baby wipes. Um, you know, we wanna make sure that we're taking care of our own personal needs as, as well, making sure that we're staying clean and healthy. Books board, and board games. This is super important, especially if we have any kids that are going to be around us or staying with us post impact. If we're without electricity, if we're without television, um, they're going to get antsy. And you know, with especially if it's hot outside, temp you know temperatures rise, our, our you know, anxiety rises, and that's not good for anybody. We want to make sure that we have something for the children to do. Actually, even for the adults to do, have some cards. You know, you can sit around the neighborhood uh, playing cards while you're waiting for the electricity to come back on or something. Paper products and plastic utensils. Again, I can't stress this enough. It sometimes gets forgotten. But if you don't have anywhere to wash plates and forks and knives, um, we don't want you to run out of things. So have the plastic stuff on standby. Cash. 
in the event that electricity is out and internet is out, grocery stores, gas stations, and places like that are going to open as quickly as possible. They may not, however, be able to take credit cards. Banks and ATMs may not be able to dispense money. That's why it's important to have an extra stack, stack of cash on hand with you so that you can go to the store and get whatever supplies you need. People often ask me, well, Mike, how much money should I have? Really, that depends on you. Um, you kind of have to kind of budget that out and figure out how much you would spend you know, in, in a week um, on just basic supplies like water or whatever. Really, it's a judgment call. It's important, though, that you have some. I want to go back up to the top of the list on something that I purposely skipped um, because I want to talk about this in great detail. Prescriptions and over-the-counter medications should be in your disaster kit. Um, prescriptions, you know, you're, you're going to need to have those on hand. Over-the-counter medications, Tylenol, um, medicine to help with an upset stomach, um, you know, sleeping pills if you need to take uh, some of those to help you sleep or stuff. But I want to draw your attention to Florida Statute 252.358. This is a state law that um, basically it states that if there is two conditions have to be met, a um, hurricane warning is in place and the governor has declared a state of emergency, including Palm Beach County in our case, um, and he puts this statute in that. That means that you can go to your pharmacy and get a 30-day refill of your prescriptions, even if you just got refilled yesterday. Biggest takeaway from this is, you know, if we don't know how long we might be without power or anything, and it's, it's a really good idea to have that extra pause, uh, refill on hand just in case. Um, don't worry about insurance and payments and all of that after the fact. But, um, but keep that in mind, um, just in case you have prescriptions that you need to have refilled and something is coming. Again, it is uh, recommended that we have enough supplies on hand for up to five days. You can go more if you want, but they used to say three to five, but most recently we've, we've discovered that five days is the better and safer way to, uh, to say that. So what other items should we have in our supply kit? Identification, especially if you are going to leave your HOA, if you're going to shelter outside of your neighborhood, you're going to want to have some sort of proof of, of residency of where you live. This is for two reasons. One, if your neighborhood should sustain damage, um, police and officials are not going to let just anybody into that neighborhood. They want to uh, avoid, you know, looky loos. They want to avoid. Uh, anybody trying to um, um, rummage and, and steal, um, and they want to keep you know keep you safe and uh, avoid anybody getting injured. Having identification is going to prove to them that yes, I live here. Medical insurance cards, home renters and flood insurance policies. Make sure you have those with you. Side note on flood insurance policy: um, make sure that you have flood insurance on your home. It's not necessarily part of most homeowners or renters insurance. It is a separate policy. It is very inexpensive to get and it's really, really worth it. Biggest thing with that is it takes 30 days for flood insurance to kick in. So if you feel like, hey, you know, Mike was right, I should have flood insurance just in case. If you go to your insurance agent tomorrow, um, tomorrow will be June 9th. It won't go into effect until at least July 9th. Birth certificates, make sure that you have those with you. list of medications. We talked about the need for having your prescriptions and everything. Have that list with you. Copy of any other legal documents that you might have. Pictures and other family memorabilia. Um, you want to make sure that this is somewhere kind of stored safe. Um, and one place I like to tell people to store this kind of stuff, inside the dishwasher. Dishwashers are built to keep water in. So they'll actually be built to keep water out. So if you have like important pictures or things like that that you want to keep safe, you put them inside the dishwasher and lock it. They'll turn it on, obviously. They'll actually be safe in there. Pictures of your house and property. Why would I want to have this? You want to have a picture of um, your house like in the day or so before 
a tropical system hits so that if you have any damage, you can compare and say, look, this is how it looked before. This is how it looks now. It wasn't pre-existing. It's going to help with the, uh, the, the, the process of claiming um, reimbursements. Okay, so step three, getting involved. An involved community truly is a resilient community. Um, you know, we really couldn't do what we do without the help of our community and without the help of our volunteers. There's a couple of places that, that you can volunteer. Uh, amateur radios, commonly called ham operators. Uh, AmeriCorps, Community Emergency Response Team. Um, I can see if, uh, is there anybody that's a CERT member on the call? No, don't see any hands up, but um, CERT is something that is near and dear to my heart. I'm uh, also the CERT coordinator for Palm Beach County. Um, the Community Emergency Response Team, these are volunteers that will go into our neighborhoods and, and help out uh, before the, um, the first responders, the fire department, emergency management can actually get there. Uh, they can do small things to like render a little bit of first aid um, and, and things like that. Um, Palm Beach County Emergency Management, we do have a volunteer program here. And uh, there's United Way. And, and that's just a small list of organizations that you can get involved with. Um, to get an extensive list, you can go to uh, www.ready.gov slash volunteer. And they'll give you a really big list of uh, places that you can uh, you can uh, volunteer with, or you can contact our office on at the phone number that's on the screen to see if there's something that you might be interested in. If you are interested in um, CERT, um, you can call that number. They'll put you through to my office, and uh, we can discuss how we're you know our next batch of training classes that we'll be doing probably in the fall. Um, I know there used to be a CERT team in uh, West Community. Um, I, I don't know if they're still active or not. I'd have to double check that, but, um, but it's, it's just a really, really good program. So another way to get involved, um, helping our neighbors. I'm sure we've all heard the, uh, the, the phrase or the catchphrase neighbors, helping neighbors. This is incredibly important when it comes to, um, hurricane preparedness as well. You can help your neighbors in the preparedness space, helping them collect emergency supplies. Hey, I'm going to the store to get some water. Do you need anything? <clears throat> um, helping them install shutters. If they have those big panels, those things are heavy and they sometimes take two, three people, um, you know, time to put them up. I mean, I got, I got a couple of friends that say it takes them all day to, to shelter or shutter their house. Get some more hands in there, you can get more houses done in less time. How about helping clean up debris from the yard, um, taking in patio furniture, anything that might be a uh, flying um, hindrance, helping evacuate. Do you have neighbors that need to evacuate or go to a spe special needs shelter? Can you provide them transportation to help get there? Maybe reach out to their family that's out of state. Um, helping after the storm. <clears throat> You know, check with their, on your neighbors afterwards. Knock on the door. Hey, are you guys okay? Do you need anything? Can I help you take the, show, the, the shutters down? Keep in mind that it is, um, it is critical, if it's not law, I believe it might be, um, that, show, that, that shutters come down as soon as possible. Um, you don't want those shutters staying up for very, very, very long, especially if you end up having, a, like, for example, a fire in the house and the fire department can't get in because the shutters are up. That's why we say, you know, get, take them down as fast as you can. And then lastly, step four is being informed. We have a couple of different things we're going to talk about in this. Uh, alert PBC, listening to your local media, and a couple of apps that you can download. So alert PBC. This is Palm Beach County's emergency notification system. This is a little, lot different than those alerts that we get on our cell phones when they have amber alerts or severe weather alerts and things. Um, this is something you actually have to sign up for, and, and I'll just walk you through that in just one second. But you can receive notifications through phone calls, text messages, and or email. You can get all three. You can pick just one if you want. 
I happen to get mine on text messages and emails. You can choose what notifications you want to get and what locations you want to get them for. I have mine again set up for my home, uh, my workplace here at the ESC, my wife's office, my stepson's school, and my parents' house. Biggest reason for my parents is they, they sometimes don't understand the technology with the cell phones and sometimes they don't even hear it when the, um, those alerts go off anyways or they don't have the TV on. So they don't know when something like a tornado watch is posted for their area. I would get that notification on my phone at which time I can call them and say, hey, something is happening, take shelter. Um, you can also choose what time of day you wish to receive alerts. By default, we stop sending alerts out at 10 o'clock at night. If you happen to be somebody that goes to bed um, super early, um, like maybe you go to bed at 8 o'clock at night, you can set it to have that uh, shut off at 8 o'clock. You don't want it to go off at 8 o'clock in the morning. You want it to go up at 9 o'clock when you get up. You have complete control and you can set that as well. So you'll receive notifications on um, things such as severe weather, flooding, gas leaks, police activity. The police activity is a very interesting one. Um, if you remember a few years ago, up in the city of West Palm, little nine-year-old um, uh, little boy walked, wandered away from his home and he was just you know, lost. They put out a notification to the neighborhood, to that, you know, whatever radius of that neighborhood was, to say, hey, be looking out for little Johnny. He's, you know, four foot tall, brown hair, wearing a red and white, uh, white striped shirt. That enables the, enables the neighbors to go out and keep an eye and look for little Johnny at the same time the authorities are looking for him. Because of alert PBC, he was found and he was returned home safely. So how do you sign up for this valuable tool? Go to www.alertpbc.com and simply create a profile. It's absolutely free to sign up and all of your information is 100% secure and strictly confidential. A lot of people are concerned that, well, you're just gonna sell my information. No, by law, you can't. This is absolutely protected information. We would much rather have that security and safety of your information so we can get more information out to you, our public. So staying tuned to local TV stations before, during, and after a storm. This is vital. You know, you want to know what's going on before it happens. What's going on during the storm? The, the local media does a fantastic job putting their people out in, in, in harm's way, really, to report on what's going on with storms while it's happening. And then after the fact, you want to know what's going on. Hey. Where can I go get supplies? Where am I going to go get some water? Where are we going with all of this? So what happens if our cable happens to go out? This is great. You should really need to do this. Um, you can go to any local uh, retail stores, Walmart, Best Buy, Target, and get an expensive TV top antenna. You plug it into your antenna, change your uh, input to antenna, do a quick scan, and you will receive local TV stations absolutely free, and you'll still be informed. The bigger the antenna, the more stations you're going to get, by the way, just a little uh, side note there. But these can go right inside the house. You can put them up on the wall. Um, I have one that's a, a stick. It's pretty long. I have it sitting behind my television out of, out of sight, out of mind, but it still works for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our Disaster Awareness and Recovery Tool. This is an app for smartphones. It is available for free on both the uh, Android and the Apple iPhone store. And this is another tool that's going to help you plan and prepare for an emergency beforehand. And it's going to help you help us by reporting damage after the fact. So on these two slides, you can kind of see what I mean by plan and prepare. I have the address listed for the EOC and uh, gives this an idea of where evacuation zones are, where shelters are, and uh, the different things. There's also, you, know, you can find out how you're gonna build a kit and how you can get involved. This here shows us a map of the evacuation zones. The red 
boxes that you see, that's Hurricane Zone A. Those are the uh, mobile home uh, uh, mobile home parks or um, other housing that's uh, with French structures that we know that they should evacuate. And then Zone B, you can see there along um, the intercoastal uh, islands. Recovery. This is a great app that shows you where your local gas stations are, grocery stores, uh, and things like that. You can see the list, for example, of uh, grocery stores, Publix on Military Trail, Sudoku Gas Station on Lake Horse Road. Biggest thing with this is call the, uh, that location ahead of time. Don't necessarily rely on the app. Um, we want to make sure that you're getting the right information. So we really encourage people, give them a call. This is a good way to find it. Oh, I've got a snowball right next to me. Let me call and see if they're open so I can go get gas for the channel. Speaking of generators, by the way, and I forgot to mention this earlier, if you do use an a gas power generator, always please make sure that you're using it outside, not even inside the garage. Put it outside of the house. You don't want those fumes sneaking back in. <clears throat> so this app will also help you report damage. When you report this damage, it gets funneled right back to the EOC in like instantly. This gives us an idea of when we say, hey, there's a lot of damage in West Boca community. We need to get down there before we go to, say, Loxahatchee. You can put the address in and then take a picture of the damage and then explain the type of damage that it is. Is it moderate? Is it high damage? Or is it extensive? This is available for both residents and business, and we encourage everybody. I don't care if we get 700 entries for the same business or house, put them in. It's better that we know. So lastly, we want you to follow us on social, social media. We are available on Facebook at Palm Beach County Division of Emergency Management. Uh, we're on Twitter at PBCDEM. And most recently, we are now on um, Instagram at PBCDEM. And our website is www.readypbc.com. There you can also download for free our hurricane planning guide. Uh, this is chock full of information. It has a shopping list of items that you should have in your emergency supply kit. Information about shelters, how to evacuate, um, you know, just a, a variety of different information. Um, it's a fantastic tool. It is free. It's also available in English, Spanish, and Creole. So if you have some uh, friends or family that aren't necessarily uh, English speaking and um, you think that they could use it in uh, Spanish, please download, print it. It is there for you. It is a free tool for our community. That is uh, all of the information that I have. Uh, I'm going to leave my phone number and my email address up there in case you have any questions, especially related to the CERT program. Um, and I am available for any questions on the webinar. All right, thank John Fisher. John, if you want to unmute yourself, John had a question. Yes, thank you, Sherry. Uh, Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Great, uh, great presentation. Um, I'm retired uh, Palm Beach County Fire Rescue, so that was a great review refresher for, for me myself. And as far as uh, like what I can, what I can add in a fire department aspect that probably a lot of people don't know, when the winds exceed 45 miles per hour, we don't go out. Um, we stop all, um, you know, uh, fire department activity and, and EMS as well. And also, too, I just wanted to add in that I think it's still uh, factual that, that most of the injuries happen after the storm. When people go out there to actually try and help out their neighbors with the power tools, the, and the chainsaws, so that's when people have to be really, really uh, careful. Um, my question to you is, and this might not be your lane, so tell me if it's not. Um, as far as our power grid goes, I know a number of years ago, uh, this FPNL caught a lot of grief because of the power outages and how, how long they were sustained. And they pushed back with the amount of uh, large palm trees that were up against power lines. Has there been anything done uh, to strengthen our power grid with regards to the trees that are up against the power lines? Um, yes, actually, very, very good question, John. Thank you. And first, let me say thank you for uh, bringing up those two really good points. 
That is absolutely correct. You can still, if once winds get to that 45 mile an hour threshold, which we consider tropical storm force winds, everything does stop at that point until we can get back out there once those winds have subsided. And yeah, it's important that you're very, very careful after the disaster when you're trying to help the neighbors and everything. And again, this is why CERT is such a valuable tool because they can really, really help and lend a hand. To answer your question with regards to the power grid, yes, FP&L has done a fantastic job on really, really fortifying the grid. When something is happening or when we stand up our EOC, they're actually standing up theirs. They're putting mobilizing vehicles in strategic places around the county. And they have it all figured out where they need to stage them based on storm tracks. And I don't get down to the southern part of the county very often, but I know in this area, they've also done a fantastic job removing a lot of the wood poles, utility poles, and replacing them with concrete. Jeanette, I see you shaking your head, so I'm guessing that they are doing that down there too. So all of that really, really does help. Excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Rosalyn, you have a question? You want to unmute yourself? Yes. What was the name of the app that you were talking about to get, I think you said, was it called DART? Is that what you said? Yes, it's a DART, Disaster Awareness and Recovery Tool. I got to look it up because I can never remember how it's worded in the app store. Anybody else? It should be in the app stores, just like that, KBC DART. Let me see if I can put my little... It's hard to do this when you're doing it in the mirror mode, but it is available as PBC DART, yes. Oh, PBC DART. Okay, that's what I was missing. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely. Anybody else have any other questions? No other questions? I have a question. Michael, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I get... Is that your screen? Yeah. Okay. No, I don't. I think somebody is sharing your screen, but... Okay. We're going to... I don't know who that is. That's interesting. Michael, can we get your presentation, either a link or a PDF form that we can use on our website and to share with our communities? I will see if I can get that sent down to you tomorrow, yes. That would be fantastic. So those that weren't able to attend, because I know a lot of people are also on Facebook watching, that they'd probably like a copy of it as well, maybe share it on their Facebook pages for the different communities. Very informative. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming in next year. Maybe we'll get a jump start and do this in early May. We used to actually have a president's breakfast in May that we always discussed hurricane preparedness with all of the community presidents. And hopefully next year we'll be able to go back to that. So we really... Hopefully we'll be able to do it in person. I hope so. I do enjoy getting out and actually coming to the communities. I think it's great that we can actually do this online, especially with the situation over the last year. But it's still fun to actually come out to the communities and see everybody's smiling faces. I agree. I agree. I don't know what that was about. We really look forward to getting back out with the community and meeting in person and having future meetings in person. So again, thank you, Michael, for doing this for us tonight and keeping us informed and sending me the link or a PDF so that we can post it. 
for our communities. Thank you to all the community members and our elected officials and our captain and lieutenant that joined us tonight. We really appreciate it. And um, we will be back with everybody soon and let you know when our next meeting is. So everyone have a great evening and we look forward to seeing you soon. Be safe. Don't forget the 4th of July at the park. Um, like the good old days, just go pull up in your car and enjoy the fireworks. Have a good one. Stay safe, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you again. Bye.